for decades now, we've been saying that the education system needs to change because clearly it's not working for our kids and yet nothing changes. One of the big reasons for that is that we're not putting the child's needs first when it comes to education. So this is what we're gonna talk about today is how to incorporate learning styles. So we need to accommodate the student with the way that they're learning as opposed to trying to expect them to accommodate us with the way we're teaching. And I'm gonna walk you through six different learning styles, how you can incorporate that in your teaching. That's what we're gonna talk about today. For those who don't know me, my name is Danielle C. Baker. I am the founder and CBO of Being Connected and I'm also a registered early childhood educator with over 20 years of experience in the field. I help parents, teachers and educators navigate the realities of what parenting is now, but don't get it twisted. When you're working with me, we're putting the child's needs first, and it's especially today. So we're gonna to have to put the pride and ego aside and let's get to it. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Talk to Danielle podcast. I am your host, Danielle C. Baker. And before we get started, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to whichever channel you're listening or watching from. And of course, with season two, this episode is brought to you by the Self-Esteem Doctor Online Academy with the amazing Dr. Simone Alicia. There is a wealth of resources on that website. I'm going to add the link in the description you can find a whole bunch of information uh, to help your child with self-esteem, with confidence, and so much more. This is perfect getting ready to go back to school. There's going to be a lot in there for you to have a look at it. So be sure to check that website now. We're going to jump right in. And it is, again, something welcome to my world. I did an episode on the play patterns and how you can determine how your child or how your students learn through their play. Uh, but this is something that's big for me, and I'm kind of an advocate for this, is working mostly with neurodivergent students. Everything that you implement for your neuro neurodivergent students works for your neurotypical students, so you're not actually doing extra work. This is what I do. This is my world. We're jumping right in. But I must say, the ego and pride needs to step aside, Okay. I've had to go through this myself as an educator of over 20 years. I know what I'm doing, right? I've been doing this forever. You're constantly learning and the children are teaching you constantly. So if you've got the blinders on and you refuse to make changes, but you're constantly complaining that your classroom is out of control or your children are, are out of control at home, you're not making any changes. So your children or your students are telling you that things are not working out for them. We're not addressing their needs. So we also have to understand that when the children misbehave in class or at home, when they're trying, when we're trying to get them to learn is most of the time it's the environment. 99% of behavioral issues in class or at home when it's time to do homework is the environment. That has nothing to do with the student, it has nothing to do with you. It's especially doesn't have anything to do with you. We make it about ourselves because we're all in our ego going, oh, they're out to get me. They want to give me a hard time. It has nothing to do with you. So we need to change that. So I'm going to go through six different learning types. And this is something that you can do. There are some tests out there to see which one is your learning type. And that's what you, that's how you understand. This is how you will learn anything. So there is actually no such thing as a bad student. We're just not teaching them properly the way that they need to be taught. That's the only difference. This is the switch that needs to be done in the education system. We don't have to rewrite the whole thing. We just need to change it. That instead of continuously fighting throughout this, these children's academic life, right? We're looking at a decade of learning that we're every year fighting with them. So why not make it easier on ourselves, make it easier on the student, make it easier on the parents and actually accommodate the student. It would save you a lot of time. And the way that you have to accommodate your students, it's gonna work for everybody. So just keep that in mind as well. I will go over the six types. I will explain how or what you can use to help them learn. And this works for anything. Be any subject, 
anything, any grade level. As long as you incorporate these in your classroom, you don't have to do six lesson plans for the same learning objective. You do the same one plan. You just tweak it a little bit so that you're accommodating all the learning types. And this will clear a lot of the behavioral issues when students are bored. That's when the trouble starts and you all know that, right? So uh, there's that. I'm gonna go through what you could do to help or to actually get them motivated to learn. And just wanna say as well, uh, just on the personal note, <laughs> my personal, we tend to spend a lot of time on the children or the students that disrupt the class, right? Because I mean, they're disruptive. Uh, but just please understand that your quiet students are also bored out of their minds. They are also struggling. They are also maybe not understanding. So don't take that for granted. This is something I personally went through throughout my academic year. Life, I mean. <laughs> I was a high-performing student, very quiet, very cooperative you know, very helpful, got everything done, had great grades, but I was miserable in school and teachers didn't believe me. I couldn't learn in school because I am neurodivergent and they tested me throughout my academic year. So the schools knew that I was neurodivergent, but they kept insisting that I was fine. So school was an absolute waste of time for me. But you're looking at my grades, and going up, there's no problem. She's learning, but I had to sit through school for six and a half, seven hours a day and wait to get home to learn by myself. So it's torture for the quiet kids too. Just keep that in mind, okay? <laughs> I'm speaking for the quiet ones. Uh, they're not doing well. And if they're coming for you or coming to you for help, take it seriously. They're not looking for attention. Nobody wants attention from their parents, from, from school. Nobody wants attention from their, their teachers. They just want to learn. They are actually struggling. They are not bugging you for attention. They need your help. So don't don't belittle them and don't embarrass them when they're coming to you for help. Okay. Um, so let's dive right in with this the learning styles. I'm going to start with the social learners. I love that one uh, simply because they could come up to be the most disruptive ones. These are the students that need to be in a social setting to learn. They learn better when they're surrounded by people, right? A lot of the times these are the students that are a little competitive as well. So they need to have these other students around them so that they can kind of outdo themselves. Uh, they're the ones that no matter where you sit them in your class, they will talk to everybody. So there isn't one magical spot in your classroom they need that they need that interaction for things to process through their heads and this is something that we saw a lot throughout the pandemic i lived it myself personally with my youngest son who was in high school at the time finishing up high school and very high performing student always in the a's and a's pluses but everything dropped when he had to start learning at home and that's because he was that student that needed the little challenge of other students around them. They needed to have that talk to talk it through so that it would actually register. So I, I saw the impact of what a social learner goes through when you cut that out. So if you're constantly teaching in a quiet setting because you want that quiet class, you want that quiet home or homework time, you are torturing the social learner. They need to talk. Trust me, they're learning when they're talking. They're still listening. They just need that movement. So for a social learner, and you will know who they are. They love, like I said, they love to talk no matter where you, you place them. They will disrupt the car, the class, or they will seem like they're wasting their time doing their homework, but this is how they're learning. They're actually learning. So when you ask them to sit quietly and not move, or if you isolate them from the class because they're disrupting the class, you're actually stopping them from learning. So this is what I mean when I say we need to put the ego and, and pride aside and address the student's needs. You are taking the child's learning tools away from them when you're isolating these students. So how do you do that without your classroom being completely chaotic? 
with these social learners, right? Because we're going to go through the solitary learners that need to be in a quiet setting. How do you balance that out? If you have two kids at home and one is a social learner, one's a loner, <laughs> learner, uh, <laughs> solitary is the better word, the solitary learner. Uh, how do you manage that, right? So in class, it, it works in, in home in a home setting as well is try to include more what we would call breakout sessions where they could be some social interaction. So instead of just doing the work alone at their desk, do some little breakout groups where they can talk about what just happened or whatever exercise you're having them do, have them work in two or three and uh, talk it through. That's going to help your social learner. They're not going to be bugging everybody else around them because now they're focused with the other two or the other one that they're with. Assign study buddies. So your social learners are going to love that. If they have a study buddy, they can pick him. You can pick them if you want. You can pair a, a social learner with a, a quieter uh, student as well. But just the fact that they can interact with somebody or they can help a student that may be struggling, that will help them learn even more so it's going to help tone down the behaviors in your class or at home as well uh allow group assignments a lot of the times because of the the, the, the again the movement in the classroom we try to do individual uh, but try to as allow some group assignments where we have an assignment if you want to work with a friend you can but if you want to work alone you can as well just to have that flexibility it doesn't change anything for you and group assignments save time in grading as well because now you've got groups it's not 35 different assignments now you have 10 if you have groups of three right 10 or 11. try to work your classroom where you can have designated areas where they could be group work so that your the students then need to be in a choir area. Just think of it in preschool and kindergarten where you have your loud learning centers like the kitchen, the blocks, the construction area away from the book, <laughs> the reading area, right? Um, it's the same thing. Try to have an area that's not in the front of the class at the door so that it sounds very loud. Maybe a little tucked away in the back of the class where you can have bean bags or cushions or whatever where the kids can kind of lounge and learn together that's really believe it or not going to tone down the noise level in your classroom as well another little thing that can really be helpful is encouraging classroom discussions at first it's a little awkward nobody wants to talk but your social learners are going to start talking so open a dialogue if you can and again, you have to adjust it according to your age group, but uh, that can help as well. So at home, if you have a social learner, obviously you don't have a 30 other kids in your room or in your in your home, uh, try to be around a little bit. Uh, you could do stuff around the house, but you're in there. So if you see that they're starting to get fidgety or they're losing interest, uh, start asking questions. Even it doesn't stop you from doing what you're you're doing, but ask them to explain to you what they learned, what they took from the class. And that encourages them to learn. Them teaching you about it is teaching them about it. So it's very helpful. The second learning type is the logical learner. I'm not doing them in any particular order. Uh, so it's not the actual number two. You're gonna notice that some of you, that most of the time we have more than one learning type. There's, a, there's definitely a primary one, but there's some secondary ones as well. So you may notice, a few of them that work together. The logical learner is your very structured, very orderly learner of students. Uh, you know, they're going to love the color coded stuff. You know, everything is in its place, everything is tucked away where they're supposed to be. So color coding, alphabetical order, that kind of thing, or everything needs to be structured. That, that gives them a sense of security, that gives them a sense of control. So those are the students that will love to have highlighters with different colors so that they can highlight their different topics a certain way. They're the ones that, the younger ones with the blocks, you know, <laughs> uh, they will stack them uh, by size, by color. They're your mathematical type of, of students. Uh, so, to enhance the learning experience for them in your class without disrupting the others. Uh, of course, they're the ones that if you have a messy classroom, they're not going to be able to learn. So they could be the quiet ones because they're so orderly and they need that. 
but uh, let's face it, teachers are hoarders <laughs> most of the time. There's way too much stuff in the classrooms and that is stopping them from being able to concentrate. Everything is so all over the place. Everything is so messy. Uh, there's too much stuff on the walls that it, it actually affects them uh, subconsciously. They're not aware of it, but they're not comfortable in a classroom that's very cluttered because it's not orderly, orderly, right? It's not, it doesn't have a, a logical order to it. So in order to help with that in the classroom, include systems and sequence in your presentation. So have graphs, have bar graphs, have color coded, like I said, different topics. Your math could be blue, your uh, reading could be green. So you, you, know, you assign the different colors, they're gonna love that. You can have them help you color code your, your subjects, they're gonna love it. So again, color code your lessons. They're going to know that they need to go and grab the green folder if they're learning, they need to read something. They're going to know they grab the blue folder if you're doing math. So they're going to be very self-sufficient students in the classroom if everything is in order for them. Alphabetically works for the older kids. Uh, color coding works, numbers as well. You can have uh, one for reading, two for, you know, you could work it the way that you want, but those are your students that are going to be able to straighten up your classroom very, very well. <laughs> they're the ones that are going to want the names on the hooks, on the desks. You know, they're they're great, great students to have to declutter your classroom. Um, like I said earlier, sort your academic material in alphabetical order and numerical order and categories and themes. So for your younger ones, you could have uh, reading stuff or the elephants, uh, you know, you could have uh, a theme if you wanted to, whatever works, but something that's structured enough for them to, to feel very comfortable in the class. Those are some of the things that you could do. Uh, but the third learning type is my favorite. I like the disruptive types. I love it because they challenge me in my teaching. Keep that in mind as a parent as well, but as a teacher, when a child is challenging you, uh, it makes you a better teacher, right? Let's try to look at the positive side of things. So that's why I love the social learners. I love the kinesthetic learners. because they're the ones that need to move, right? They need to touch, they learn through their, their sense of touch almost. They need to move, they need to feel, they need to manipulate, they need to take things apart, they need to put them together. So they could come across as very destructive in a classroom or in a quiet home setting but if you sit them down all day they're going to be miserable 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 so there's needs to be movement if you're punishing them those are the students that usually their 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 punishment is to stay inside recess so what i never got that even as a, a child i never got that the child needs to let out some steam it's an excess energy they need to move. They need to run. They're, they're, they're just about to burst at the seams and we're taking away the 15 minutes that they have to actually do that. So now they've got even more potential energy in them to go into the next class and be even worse. It's like a pressure cooker at that point. So of course, by the afternoon, there are absolutely impossible, but we created that. It's not the child's fault. This is what I mean by there's no such thing as a bad student. It's just a bad way of teaching. Again, ego and pride aside, we have to admit it. We, a lot of the times as teachers and educators, we are the ones who provoke the behavior because we're so set on you're gonna do it my way instead of opening it up a little bit. So your kinesthetic students, they have them act out the lessons. They're gonna love that. You could do a whole art production, uh, act out the lesson. So you have them mime what you're teaching, have them, you know, of course you do need to keep it under control so that they don't lose control and it, it becomes chaotic, but it could be fun for the other students as well. Even the ones that are a little shy that would never go out there, they can help you. And so, okay, we're having a hard time understanding this. What, what would that look like for you if you, you know, acted out, if you were a car, if you were whatever, the kids have a great imagination. So they'll, they'll, fi they'll find it for you. Uh, in include hands-on activities. So if you're doing things like mathematics, if you have concepts on the units of measurement, so let's say, so we all have those little blocks for one centimeter, the decimeters, we have the meters, 
that's great, but incorporate other things that they can touch. Uh, they could even do it with Play-Doh. They could roll out 10 centimeters. So they're still learning the same thing. They're just moving, all right? So have them have something that they can move around. Plan for moving breaks. So it's it's torture. Even adults can't even do that. If you sit in a conference meeting or even as teachers you're, you're, you're on your PD days uh, or that first meeting that you have before school starts, it is absolute torture to be sitting there. We can't do it. When uh, COVID had started and uh, conference calls were the thing, they used to tell us then that adults after eight minutes they, they can't do it anymore. So we need to change it up in terms of visual presentation, in terms of energy levels every eight minutes. And this, to me, eight minutes is still too long. So if, if adults need to move after so-called eight minutes, how do we expect students to stay sit, sitting still for six and a half hours? It's not reasonable. So plan for moving breaks. When you start seeing these students fidgeting a little bit more, change it up, have them stand up, have them turn around their chair and come back. All of them, all of the students need it. If your fidgety students are, are fidgeting, uh, your, your quiet students need to move as well. They're just a bit more subdued, but they need to move as well. So have them move, move them around. There's a lot of programs now in schools where they'll have those little uh, moving breaks with videos on the smart boards where they, they just follow along. They move a little bit and then they sit back down. Two minutes is enough, 30 seconds is enough. We could do that. Have tennis balls as well. Uh, the students that need to constantly be touching something, or if you have tennis balls that they can roll under their feet, uh, and don't worry, they're not going. The tennis balls are not going to be flying all over the place if you set the rules and make things clear right away. But just to have something rolling around their feet, there they have that now with the stationary pedals that they can pedal, and there's so many other things that you can do. But if you don't have that kind of budget. Tennis balls work really well. Uh, you could get at the dollar store the little neck rollers as well. That works. It keeps them moving without disrupting. The foam, uh, the foam rollers are great because they don't make any noise and they won't fly off if ever they they roll too fast. Those are great as well. You can get them at the dollar store a lot of the time. So you use that. It's it's very helpful. Um, when you have to do a demonstration in class, use your kinesthetic students. That will help as well. At home, it's okay if they do their homework standing up. Have them walk around the table. Have them do a little run from one end of the house to the other and let's get back to it. Give them breaks depending on what the child needs as if it's every two minutes, every 10 minutes. You know, try not to make it sitting down more than 10 minutes. They can move around, just wiggle a little bit and then go back into it. It helps them a lot too. And it helps the ones that don't need to move. So that, those are very helpful. Uh, the next uh, learning type is your visual learners. And this is, I am primarily a visual learner. I have a photographic memory. So this is my field right here. Those are the ones that need to see something to remember. And that's really what it is. I need to see it. You could tell me anything about anything. If I don't have a visual, I'm not retaining a thing. I'm not going to remember everything. Even now. Uh, at my age. If I can't see it, I will decide because I have a photographic memory, every word that you tell me, every word that comes to me, I take, like, I make a picture of something that relates to it. So, like, I've got, like, a series of pictures in my head instead of words. Visual learners are like that. They need a visual. If you're standing in front of, and you're just talking, and there's nothing to support your, what you're teaching in terms of visuals, they're not retaining anything. So add pictures, add diagrams to your presentations, add little emojis, little stickers, little popsicle sticks with pictures on them. So give them a visual of some, if you can't have the pictures because you don't want to be printing out a whole bunch of stuff, give them a, a, a an imaginary visual, right? I can relate words to shapes. That's how I'm going to remember it. If you explain something to me and then I can relate it to say, oh, that's that's like that's like fire. And then that's it. I, I got it. I'm good to go. You know, so give them a visual of it. What would that look like? 
and they'll get it. Use descriptive words when you're explaining something just to help the visualization, like I was saying. So it's actually I was actually using that teaching how to make chocolate truffles in a chocolate class. But yeah, I was just telling you, you want to roll them no bigger than a donut hole. Uh, so all of my students got it. They knew exactly what I was talking about. And, and they they learned it from then on. They knew exactly what size they needed to roll the, 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 the truffles. So this is an example. Uh, allow students to draw or doodle when you're speaking. Again, when we're saying ego and pride, we tend to assign the students not looking at you when you're teaching as a sign of disrespect. I was one who needed, because the students in my generation, as the teachers in my generations were teaching in front of a board, just writing notes or just talking. There was no visuals. We didn't have, we had the projectors, but that they, a lot of teachers weren't using those. So there was no visual. So I had to doodle, like draw squares, triangles, whatever I could so that I could associate that picture to whatever it is the teacher was talking about. So if I just look, if I they were teaching a science concept and I was drawing or doodling something with triangles, every time I'd see a triangle, I would be able to go back to the concept the teacher was, was teaching. That's how visual learners work. They need to associate a picture to what you're teaching them. So just keep that in mind. If you don't have any visuals and they're doodling, they're not disrespecting you, they are learning. So if you're taking those pens away from them, those notebooks away from them because they're supposedly not respectful, you're actually taking their learning tools away. So just remember that as well. Do live term demonstrations. Again, when I was saying with your kinesthetic students where you act out the lesson, do the same that's going to help your visual learners because now they're going to see the uh, the play that was going on in front of them. They don't need to participate, but just the fact that they're seeing it. You know, if you're the, the things like I was saying, acting out, if you're doing the measurement, I guess that's the one that's the one example I'm going to be doing. If you're teaching them what a foot is or a meter, have them take the one step. The, your your kinesthetics, uh, your social learners, they're gonna love acting that out. It's a just giant step to see who can actually do the whole meter or the whole foot or whichever distance you're giving them. They're gonna remember that no matter where you are, you can do that outside if you don't wanna get too messy. You can use chalk, sidewalk chalk and stuff like that. It's really fun. Now I'm gonna jump over to the solitary learners. Uh, those are the ones who need to be alone. I was a solitary learner. I needed to be alone uh, to, to learn. It was easier for me to concentrate. I could just go in my own little world, come up with all the pictures in my head that I needed to associate to what I was learning. Those need that alone time. So of course, if there's a lot of movement in the classroom, you're gonna need to allow some quiet time where these students can sit and just process everything that they, they've just learned. So assign a quiet area for individual work. This is the areas that you want to put in the front of your class near the door. So it's quiet when people are walking by. Uh, it's not going to sound like a chaotic class. And when people are walking by, it's not really going to disrupt those solitary students either. So you're not interrupting them. So, uh, include independent study time. So when you do have stuff with group play, give that maybe even just it's great to do it at the end of your class, like the last five, 10 minutes of individual learning time. It quiets everybody down. You can kind of sort out your papers before the next class and it just smooths everything over, right? If there are group assignments, if you really have to have group assignments, pair up your solitary learners with only one more student. So do a group of two instead of having a group of four or five because they're the ones that are gonna retreat even though they they can be great students, very perform like high performing students, they will not want to participate because there's too many people. So just assign one more person with them, so that they feel somewhat comfortable. And um, plan sometimes where the students can come up to you individually to ask for questions. So during the learning time, individual learning time, you could be at your desk or wherever you choose, where they can come up and ask you individually, but not in front of everybody. It's gonna help them a lot. Uh, at home, again, just keep them away from the other siblings if they need to, it can be very helpful. Uh, the last learning uh, style is auditory. So it, just like the visuals, these guys are uh, all about hearing. They learn through 
hearing. So the auditory learners need to have some kind of background noise that helps them a lot. It doesn't have to be disruptive. It could just be some kind of background music, but they're the ones that work really well with rhythmic movements, um, rhyming stuff. They just, they if it's too quiet, they'll actually start tapping on their desk, uh, but that's actually helping them learn. So the, the tapping is helping them absorb what they're learning. It's the same, it's kind of like the visual learning that needs a visual, it needs to see something that they can associate to what they're learning. If the auditory learners need a sound to associate to what they're learning. So if you're not incorporating some kind of sound to it, and when I say sound, again, doesn't have to be disrupting very loud, but like I said, something that's rhythmic. So when you're teaching, you can clap to the rhythm and talk and have them repeat and talk or start talking with a higher voice and then a lower voice. And then there's something like this that breaks up the monotony, monotony, monot wow, I'm so sorry, I can't find my words today, but you know what I mean? So, you know, play some background music in your individual learning play, or if they're at home doing their homework, or just a little soft music in the background. Uh, that helps a lot. They will actually, when they hear the song, they will remember what they <laughs> were actually learning. Uh, again, they can drum a beat when you're when you're speaking. They could drum a beat. Everybody could do it, and you go to their rhythm. Uh, rhyme your lessons. This is great. This is why we have nursery rhymes. This is why Dr. Seuss is so successful. Is because we learn through rhythm. We learn through music, melodies, re repetition. So uh, have rhyme your lessons if you can. If you're creative enough. Uh, it's a lot of fun, actually, and all the students are going to love it. And use sound effects when you're describing something. This is really easy for me because French people naturally use sound effects when they speak. Um, so you could come up to a French person and say, I need the push, 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 push. Sometimes we'll do that. The, so we know that that's the spray bottle. The push, it makes a push, push sound. So it's the push, push. Uh, that's just an example. We always laugh about that one. But use sound effects. And it's great for your auditory learners. It's great for your social learners. It's great for your the, the, your students that need a, a little bit more movement. So it works for everybody. Sound effects are great. It's going to make them laugh. They're going to remember what you just taught them. So those are the six learning styles. Again, uh, very broad. Uh, if you need more information, if you wanted more uh, examples of how you can incorporate that. Again, you don't need to make six separate lesson plans for the one learning objective to accommodate everybody, but find out, like I said, a little bit of background music, a little bit of rhyming here. Let's get up and move. Let's sit down and relax throughout your lesson. And you've got everybody happy. So keep that in mind. It is very helpful. Play around in your class, make it fun. Again, don't forget that the quiet students are bored out of their mind too. Right? That's just the reality of it. You could be a great teacher, but if you're teaching the same way as been, we've been teaching for the last couple of centuries, every single student in there is bored out of their mind, okay? And keep in mind as well, it has nothing to do with you. So the behaviors has nothing to do with you. If you need to teach a different way, the way that you're teaching is not working for a student, it has nothing to do with you. You're not a bad teacher. It's just not working for that student. Their brain is not wired that way. So just change it up a little bit. It's great. This is how you become an even better teacher. Students will not remember most of their teachers. The only time that they remember a teacher is if they were a, a spectacular or horrifying, right? But most of the time, students will grow through their academic years and they won't even remember their teachers. So it has nothing to do with you. But it will make a difference if you're actually helping them and make them feel like they're, they they have a chance to succeed. So I'm going to leave you with that. Have fun with it. If you have any questions, don't forget to uh, contact me. I can give you so much more. I do have lesson plans for that. I can help you. I can do demonstrations, live demonstrations. I do have videos with live demonstrations. I can show you what that would look like in a classroom and at home. I can do it for homeschooling as well, or the, the micro, the pod schools works very well, because now you have different ages 
and different learning styles and all that fun stuff. So I could definitely help you with that as well. And uh, don't forget to like, follow and subscribe to whichever channel you're listening and watching from. And don't forget to check out the Self-Esteem Doctor Online Academy. There will be some great things there to help you get started with the new school year. So I will leave you with that until then. Stay safe. Stay awesome. And we'll talk soon.